In today's exciting episode of Gene Expression and Regulation, we're going to cover the topic of how prokaryotic cells regulate the expression of their genes through structures known as operons. <laughs> okay, here we go. So first, a little background. Escherichia coli is a species of bacteria that lives in the colon, the intestine, of animals, including humans. So the first thing you need to realize about E. coli is essentially they eat what you eat. The nutrients that you provide through the food that you consume and digest are the nutrients that E. coli have to use for their own nourishment. So take tryptophan, for example. Tryptophan is an amino acid. E. coli have to have tryptophan in order to survive. So if you have not eaten anything recently that contains a large amount of tryptophan, the E. coli living in your colon are going to have to make their own tryptophan using metabolic pathways that they have in their cytoplasm. On the other hand, if you have recently eaten something that is rich in tryptophan, then there is plenty of this amino acid available for the E. coli, and they no longer need to manufacture it. Um, so whether or not bacteria need to make tryptophan depends on what you have recently eaten, and it depends on whether or not tryptophan is available in the environment of the bacteria. So natural selection is going to favor bacterial cells that express only the genes whose products are currently needed by the cell. In other words, bacteria are going to survive better if they are able to switch genes on when they are needed and switch genes off when they are not needed. A metabolic pathway, such as the tryptophan synthesis pathway, can be controlled or regulated on two different levels. There's two basic mechanisms by which a bacterial cell can regulate the tryptophan synthesis pathway. The first way is to regulate the activity of enzymes that are already present in the cell. In other words, if there's already a plentiful supply of tryptophan, it doesn't make sense to continue making tryptophan. And so the enzymes that make tryptophan can be temporarily switched off. The second way to do this is to regulate the expression of genes that code for the enzymes that make the tryptophan. So it's kind of the same logic. If there's already plenty of tryptophan available for the cell, it temporarily needs to shut down the production of tryptophan. It doesn't need to make any more tryptophan right now. And so one way to do that is to shut down or switch off the genes which code for the enzymes which make tryptophan. So we're going to talk about both of these mechanisms. We're going to mainly focus on the second one. Okay, so I know this looks complicated, but let's see if we can make some sense out of this diagram. So here is tryptophan. Tryptophan, remember, is an amino acid. So E. coli use tryptophan the same way you and I use tryptophan, that is to build proteins. And sometimes there's going to be plenty of tryptophan available in the environment of the bacteria. Other times the bacteria is going to have to make its own tryptophan. And you can see there's a pathway, a metabolic pathway, a series of chemical reactions that can happen inside the E. coli cell that makes tryptophan. So there's some molecule called a precursor. That's the molecule that we start with. 
and there's an enzyme that converts that molecule into some intermediate compound and then a second enzyme converts this chemical into this chemical and finally there's a third enzyme in the pathway that converts this chemical into the finished product which is tryptophan so this is a pathway that E. coli can use it involves three different enzymes it involves multiple chemical reactions but it makes tryptophan so let's assume that you have just eaten something some kind of food that has a lot of tryptophan so your colon is awash in tryptophan there's plenty of tryptophan available for the E. coli they no longer need to to make more tryptophan so one way to regulate this is the tryptophan molecule actually has the ability to bind with this enzyme so again if there's a large amount of tryptophan some of those tryptophan molecules can physically bind to this enzyme and temporarily shut it down that's called feedback inhibition because the overabundance of tryptophan is going to inhibit or shut down temporarily this enzyme. Now what's that going to do? It's going to stop the first step in this metabolic pathway and of course if you don't do the first step then you can't do the second step or the third step. So it's temporarily shutting down the synthesis of tryptophan which makes sense because remember the cell already has a large amount of tryptophan. Now I said there were two ways that E. coli can regulate their tryptophan pathway. Here's, here's the other way. If you notice, there are one, two, three, four, five different genes, five different genes in the E. coli genome that code for these various enzymes. So there's two different genes that code for enzyme number one, there's one gene that codes for enzyme number two and there's two genes that code for enzyme number three. So one way to shut down this pathway would be to shut down the transcription of these genes. If these five genes are not transcribed, then they're not going to be translated either. In other words, if you don't make the messenger RNA, you're not going to make the protein. So if you can shut down these five genes, you can temporarily shut down the production of the enzymes. So if there's a large amount of tryptophan in the E. coli cell, some of those tryptophan molecules will kick off a series of events that shuts down the transcription of these genes. That means these three enzymes will temporarily not be produced by the cell and without these enzymes this pathway shuts down. So two separate ways that the tryptophan synthesis pathway can be temporarily shut down. First way by regulating the activity level of this enzyme that's called feedback inhibition and then the second way is that the tryptophan molecule can affect whether or not these five genes are expressed by shutting down the five genes it also shuts down the production of these three enzymes okay so our objectives today are to better understand the regulation of gene expression in prokaryotes so we're going to mainly well not just mainly for the rest of our lesson today we're only going to focus on this part of the process that is the regulation of gene expression um, we're going to define a term called operon and lastly we're going to try to understand the difference between an inducible operon so first we're going to learn what is an operon and then we're going to learn the difference between an inducible operon and a repressible operon. We're going to learn about the repressible type first. And the example is called the TRP or TRIP 
operon. Okay, so let's begin by talking about what is an operon. Now to understand this, you need to understand what you're seeing in this picture. This entire blue strip all the way across here, that's DNA. So we're looking at the DNA of an E. coli cell. An operon is a sequence of genes. In this particular case, there's five of these genes. Sometimes they're called structural genes. So it's a sequence of genes that code for proteins. Each one of these genes codes for a separate polypeptide. Okay. So a sequence of genes that code for proteins that have some kind of related function. So all five of these polypeptides work together in the E. coli cell to do something, some kind of related function. In this particular case, these five polypeptides are joined together to make up three different enzymes. What is the job of those enzymes? Tryptophan synthesis. So these proteins are all involved in the making of tryptophan. Now remember, we just talked about the fact that E. coli doesn't always need to make tryptophan. It only needs to make tryptophan when it doesn't have enough of it. <clears throat> so an operon is multiple genes that code for different polypeptides which have some related function together with a promoter. So this is part of the operon as well. Remember, the promoter is the region of DNA that RNA polymerase attaches to at the beginning of transcription. So this little guitar pick, remember that's the enzyme, RNA polymerase, which carries out transcription of genes. Now in a eukaryotic cell, there's one promoter for each individual gene. Each gene has its own promoter. Notice that is not the case in bacteria. We have one, two, three, four, five different genes here, and there's one promoter for this whole operon, one promoter for all five genes. So basically, the cell is either going to transcribe all five genes or none of them. It's all or nothing. And right in between the promoter and the genes is a little region of DNA right here shown in yellow in this picture called the operator. The operator is basically the master switch, the on-off switch for the operon. So here's some definitions. The operator is, like I said, it's like an on-off switch. It's the sequence of DNA um, downstream of the promoter. So that means it's right after the promoter or just to the right of the promoter to which a repressor may bind. Well, what the heck is a repressor? Well, a repressor is a protein. It's a protein that can bind to the operator when it is in its active form. Now, notice this repressor protein is not always active, but when it is active, it can bind to the operator. And what does that mean? It's going to prevent RNA polymerase from transcribing the genes in the operon. That'll make more sense when we look at it. And then one other thing, I, I didn't mention this yet. I didn't want to confuse you too early in the process, but there's a separate gene right here called the regulatory gene that's technically not part of the operon. This is the operon over here. But just a little bit upstream of the operon, there's one lonely gene, a separate gene called the regulatory gene. And when that gene is transcribed and translated, it makes a protein, and that's the repressor protein. And you'll see why that's so important 
in just a minute. So the regulatory gene is the gene that's not part of the operon, but it's close to the operon, and it codes for the repressor protein. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this review. You know that a gene is a segment of DNA that codes for a polypeptide. The promoter is the nucleotide sequence on the DNA that marks the beginning of a gene. So it tells RNA polymerase where to bind to begin transcription. Transcription is when RNA is synthesized from a DNA template and translation is the second step of gene expression when the RNA, the mRNA template, is used by the ribosome to link amino acids together in the correct order to build the protein, and you know that. Okay, so the first operon we're going to look at specifically is the TRIP operon, TRP is short for tryptophan. So um, this is an example of a repressible operon because the presence of tryptophan is going to repress the genes. When tryptophan is present, the genes right here are going to be switched off and they're not going to be transcribed. The structural genes that I'm pointing to right here, trip E, trip D, trip C, B, and A, those structural genes code for polypeptides, which make up enzymes for tryptophan synthesis. So what does that mean? It means these five genes only need to be transcribed. They only need to be switched on when the cell needs to make tryptophan. If there's already a plentiful supply of tryptophan, it would be a tremendous waste of resources, a tremendous waste of energy to build enzymes whose only job is to build tryptophan. It doesn't make sense to do that. Why waste energy making tryptophan if there's already a plentiful supply of tryptophan? So let's take a closer look. Let's look at the scenario of when there is no tryptophan present. So the cell is desperate for tryptophan. If it doesn't make tryptophan, it will die. Okay, so no problem. RNA polymerase attaches to the promoter. It moves down the operon and it transcribes this gene. It transcribes this gene, this gene, this gene, this gene. Here's the messenger RNA that just got made by transcription. The ribosome is going to read this entire strand of messenger RNA and make all five polypeptides, which are going to make up the enzymes, and tryptophan is going to be synthesized. Okay. In other words, if there's no tryptophan present, these five genes are expressed, the enzymes are made, and tryptophan is going to be synthesized by its normal metabolic pathway. Notice the regulatory gene is also being transcribed and translated. This gene, by the way, doesn't have an on-off switch. The regulatory gene is always transcribed. So the repressor protein is always being made. It's always going to be present in the cytoplasm. But notice also it's made in its inactive form. This protein is not able to do anything right now. It's, it's in its inactive form. But notice how that changes when tryptophan is present. So here's tryptophan. Let's say the cell has built up a plentiful supply of tryptophan. Or maybe the host, you, have eaten a, a diet that is rich in tryptophan. So there's plenty of tryptophan in your colon. The E. coli has all the tryptophan it needs right now. Some of that excess tryptophan will bind to the allosteric site, that's this little opening on the repressor protein. When tryptophan binds to the repressor, look what happens. It changes shape. 
it, it goes from being inactive to being active. And the active repressor is able to bind to the operator. Let's go back and look at this. Remember the operator is the on-off switch. It's right here. It's in between the promoter and the rest of the operon. Well, when tryptophan is present, it binds to the repressor protein, switches the repressor protein to its active form, and that active repressor will physically bind to the operator. Now that's a big deal because when RNA polymerase tries to move from the promoter down here to transcribe these genes, it can't. There's a roadblock. It physically is blocked by this active repressor. It cannot move past that repressor protein. That means none of these five genes is going to be transcribed. We're not going to be able to go from DNA to RNA, which means the enzymes cannot be made, which is, which is a good thing. It doesn't make sense to make enzymes that you don't need. It doesn't make sense to make enzymes that make tryptophan when you already have a large amount of tryptophan in the cell. Now, eventually, with these five genes shut off, eventually the supply of tryptophan will run out. And at some point in the future, the cell is once again going to be in need of tryptophan. So when all that tryptophan is gone, including this tryptophan, which is bound to the repressor, we'll go right back the way we started. When all the tryptophan is gone, the repressor becomes inactive, which means it will detach from the operator. It's in its inactive form. And now there's nothing blocking transcription. The promoter will be able to trans, or excuse me, RNA polymerase will be able to transcribe those genes and make the enzymes. So tryptophan, um, is a repressor in a way. So um, it's a, we call it a co-repressor. In other words, the presence of tryptophan is switching the genes off. So the trip operon is a repressible operon. Again, when tryptophan is present, the genes are switched off. When tryptophan is absent, the genes are switched on. Okay, let's look at a different operon in E. coli, which is called the LAC operon. By the way, today's code word is spring break. The first 10 people to send me an email with spring break in the subject line, you get your 10-point bonus. And here is a bonus extra credit opportunity. The first five people to email me the answer to this question will get a bonus 10 points. I want to know the two scientists who first discovered operons. I want the name, the first and last name of the two scientists who discovered operons and the year in which they made that discovery. If you're the first five people to email me that answer, you get a bonus 10 points. So let's look at the LAC operon. LAC stands for lactose. E. coli have an operon called the LAC operon that's made up of three structural genes. And each one of those genes codes for an enzyme. Uh, and these enzymes have a related function. That is, the hydrolysis and metabolism of lactose. Lactose is a sugar, it's a disaccharide that is present in milk. So remember, E. coli live in your colon. So every time you drink milk or eat ice cream or yogurt or cheese, there's going to be a plentiful supply of this disaccharide, lactose, floating around in your colon. And the E. coli cells can take it in, break it down by hydrolysis, 
and then further break down the sugars made from lactose to get energy. But if you haven't had any milk or cheese or ice cream or yogurt, there's not any lactose in your colon. And so it does not make sense for an E. coli cell to constantly make these enzymes. There's no reason to produce these enzymes all the time if there's not always going to be lactose available to break down. In other words, it doesn't make sense to produce lactose digesting enzymes when there ain't no lactose, right? So just like with the trip operon, you want to be able to switch these genes on when they are needed and switch them off when they are not needed. Now the lac operon is very similar to the trip operon in the sense that, you know, it's got a promoter, it's got an operator, and then it's got the structural genes. Now there's only three structural genes, whereas the trip operon had five. But the biggest difference between these two operons is that the LAC operon is inducible. That means the presence of lactose, which is shown by this little green circle, the presence of lactose does not repress these genes, it induces them. When lactose is present, it's not going to um, switch the genes off, it's going to switch them on. Okay, so let's see if we can understand why that is. Okay, so just like with the trip operon, there's a, a gene that is separate from the operon. In this case, it's called the LAC-I gene. It, it's always on. It, this is the uh, regulatory gene, and it codes for the repressor protein. This gene is always on. It does not have an on-off switch. So whether or not lactose is present, the repressor protein is going to be made. Um, the repressor protein in this case is made in its active form. It can switch to its inactive form if lactose is present, but the enzyme is normally in its active form. Um, and then I mentioned before there are three structural genes. They have names, LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A. Each one of those codes for a different enzyme that has some job to do, but, but they all have a related function, which is the breakdown and metabolism of lactose. Okay, so it only makes sense to switch these genes on and make these enzymes when lactose is present. So let's see how the lac operon actually works. So let's assume that today you haven't had any milk or ice cream or yogurt or cheese. So there is no lactose in your colon. There's no lactose available for E. coli to digest. So remember, the regulatory gene is always on. It's always being transcribed and translated. So here's the repressor protein, which is coded by the regulatory gene and it's in its active form. What does that mean? It means it has the right shape when it's when it's active, it has the right shape that will allow it to bind to the operator. Remember that's a roadblock. That means RNA polymerase all it can do is attach to the promoter. It cannot get past this roadblock. It cannot transcribe the three genes down here which means those three enzymes will not be made, which is great. There's no reason to make those enzymes if there ain't no lactose to digest, okay? But let's say later on today, you eat a nice big bowl of delicious ice cream. And so now you have lots of lactose floating around in your colon. Your E. coli bacteria are going to start taking in that lactose, breaking it down, getting energy from it. But to do that, they need these three enzymes. So allolactose, which is just a form of lactose, shown by this little green circle, is going to come in, bind to the repressor. So 
this is lactose, remember, and you've just eaten a bunch of ice cream, so there's a bunch of lactose inside the cell. Lactose is going to bind to the repressor, changing it to its inactive form. The presence of lactose changes the repressor to its inactive form. Now the shape has changed. It can no longer bind to the operator. And even the ones that were already bound to the operator, as soon as they bind with lactose, as soon as they change shape, they will let go. They will unbind from that operator. And now there's no roadblock. RNA polymerase will move freely down the operon, transcribing all of these genes, and the enzymes will be made. What do these enzymes do? Remember, they break down lactose. So eventually, as these enzymes are synthesized and they start breaking down the lactose, eventually all of that lactose is going to be gone. And so eventually we're going to be right back to here. When the lactose is gone, the repressors all switch back to their active form. They go back and they bind to the operator, blocking the transcription of the genes. So again, with the LAC operon, when lactose is present, the genes are switched on so that lactose can be digested. When lactose is absent, the genes of the LAC operon are switched off. There's a great animation that I found that shows how it kind of puts that LAC operon into motion. And rather than try to play it here on the recording, I'm just going to post this along with today's lecture. But I hope you'll watch it because I think it makes more sense. It's, it's a little hard to get a sense of how this works unless you see it in motion. And so the animation is really helpful in that way. So just a, a, a final comparison here. Um, remember that the um, one of these operons is inducible and one is repressible. And so the trip operon, which is this one down here, is repressible. When tryptophan is present, it represses the genes. Tryptophan shuts the genes down. The LAC operon is inducible. The presence of lactose induces the genes, turns them on. So when lactose is present, the LAC operon genes are switched on. They are induced. When tryptophan is present, the trip operon genes are switched off. Tryptophan represses, lactose induces. So this is a one of those tricky concepts. You probably want to go back and watch this lesson twice. I know that's torture. It's torture to watch it once. But go back and watch it a second time because it's easy to get confused. These operons are just similar enough <laughs> to be confusing. Um, but it's really important that you understand the difference between an inducible operon and a repressible operon. Our next lesson, and this will be sometime after spring break, um, is going to be the regulation of gene expression in eukaryotic cells. So be sure to read pages 308 to 313 in your textbook to prepare for that lesson. I hope you guys have a great spring break. I hope you're doing well at home. And I miss you terribly. I hope to see you sometime soon. Take care.